From Software titles truly stand the test of time when it comes to video games. So much so that they inspire Imitation Souls games to be developed and released to players everywhere. From Demon Souls to the Dark Souls trilogy, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring. When we play any Souls-like title, we can't help but to compare these titles to the works of From Software. The funny thing is, is that From Software hasn't done anything that we haven't seen throughout the history of the games industry when it comes to how we progress through their games to the challenges and the bosses. The only thing that they seem to do that outmatch every other game to date is their storytelling ability, the way that they keep you immersed in their games. It is a formula that seems to be difficult for most other development teams to even mimic. That doesn't mean that there aren't other games that do this, but this does mean that they show that this ability is few and far between. To this day, people can still compare their findings throughout Souls titles, whether that be speculations of their stories, to the way that they build their characters, and even the many unique ways that people can make progression. Souls runners of any kind really helped shine the light on this fact, especially those who chose to keep their characters at the bare minimum to add more of a challenge to already challenging titles. So why then does Round 8 seem to be getting the praise that they are getting for Lies of P? Did they really manage to do what From Software did and more? In this video, we will dive into that very conversation by looking at Round 8 and comparing the Lies of P to the Souls trilogy, Bloodborne, and Sekiro. Unfortunately, I do not have recorded footage of Elden Ring or Demon Souls, and honestly when it comes to Demon Souls, I have quite the controversial opinion on the remake, so I won't be adding this into the conversation, but rather I will be doing a short video on that game to spark another conversation amongst the community. If I did add Elden Ring into this conversation as far as comparisons go, I think Elden Ring would absolutely be unfair to compare Lies of P to, given its sheer size and design. Though I may compare boss fights in the future, I think a good place to start would be with the listed titles. So let's begin with a brief summary of the Round 8 development team. Round 8 hasn't been around long, in fact their first game was Bless Unleashed, an MMORPG published by Bandai Namco back in 2020. So already we can see a very important pattern here for the sake of comparison. Their first title was published by Bandai Namco, which also publishes most of From Software's titles. That's a big way to get your name introduced into the games industry. However, their first game didn't seem to get the reception they were looking for, landing them at a score of 57 on Metacritic. That's a far cry from the 80 that you'll see for Lies of P as of the making of this video. I normally don't use Metacritic as a metric for how games are, however I thought it would be important to utilize the score to show the progression of the studio even in their beginning stages. Also, not bad for a self-published title, right? Though I personally believe that this game deserves way more praise than that given the facts presented, but we can't just skate past the fact that they were introduced to the world by Bandai Namco. I speculate that the team may have picked up a few ideas roaming the halls and maybe a few tips on developing their next title. And here today we have Lies of P. Keep in mind that Code Vein came in under the umbrella of Bandai Namco as well, so they are no stranger to Souls and Souls-like titles. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that Round 8 would be able to create such an amazing title. But do they do Souls better? We'll start by putting Lies of P against the Dark Souls trilogy. I know that Bloodborne is the most comparable game, but there are elements of Lies of P that pull from the Dark Souls trilogy that I would like to analyze before we get to that point. The Dark Souls trilogy has definitely seen its ups and downs when it comes to the public opinion, and I have definitely given my fair share of criticisms. In my Dark Souls trilogy review, I said that the first Dark Souls felt slow and clunky. The second Dark Souls controls had a mind of their own, trapping you not only in the attack animation but the direction that the animation is in, and has a story that is all over the place as its map design, and I virtually had zero bad to say when it came to the third installment. Even with the things I said about 2, I still say to the new players, I recommend playing it because it grew on me despite all of its flaws. 
truth of the matter is that you could probably skip to seeing that the story tries to do its own thing while incorporating elements of the first installment, but to experience the best that the third has to offer, two helps give the understanding of the development of the Soul series. Before I continue, if there are any new players to the Lies of P, I encourage you to skip ahead to the next segment, seeing as there will be spoilers in this portion, and I don't want to ruin the story for you. Dark Souls tells a story that is open-ended throughout the trilogy, meaning that there was always a cliffhanger and the possibility for new installments to be introduced, and for the first two, fans weren't disappointed. The third title left the open-ended possibility for another installment that would never be delivered to us, and the speculation of what happened after you either extinguished or relit the first flame. And thanks to the developers that are trying to bring games like Dark Souls Nightfall, we can continue to enjoy the story through the lenses of fans everywhere. So where does Lies of P fit into all of this? Well, Lies of P manages to tell multiple stories in one while keeping the story open-ended and at the same time manages to hint at DLC and a new game, which at the time of the making of this video, DLC has been confirmed. No matter what ending you choose for the Lies of P, you will always see Dorothy's shoes, you will always see the phone conversation on the train, and you will always have the question of who is the real puppeteer pulling the strings to make these stories be possible to be sewn together. I want to take this time right now to address something that I've stumbled across, and that is that P is actually the Tin Man. By storytelling logic, I could see this being the case if at one of the endings you didn't sacrifice your own life to Sophia. Even in the bad ending where you actually give your pea organ to Geppetto throws a wrench in this theory because you are now Carlo, and the free from the strings ending closes the door on this theory because if the next installment is about Dorothy, then they must go see the wizard for the Tin Man's heart. The best possible explanation that I have seen as to who the Tin Man might be is the puppet that you encounter in the swamp who you teach emotions to. You can also speculate that in the next game that in order to get a heart for the Tin Man, they would have to steal the pea organ from Sophia. That was a bit of a tangent. However, if you look at these theories alone, it tells you how much they've left open to question about the story as a whole. Krat is just an experiment the whole time, but does that mean Ergo will remain in the next part? Or since Ergo came from a person, that person seemingly Sophia, does that mean another exists with the ability to house Ergo in their body? These were the kinds of questions asked when talking about the first flame of Dark Souls. In the first, you are the chosen, destined to relight the flame or bring about darkness, but mostly relight the flame. In the second, you are considered the cursed, destined to sit in the throne of want to essentially prevent the age of darkness. And in the third, you are the ashen one charged with seating all those before that were chosen, known as the Lords of Cinder, back on their thrones after they turned away from their duties. Keep in mind that between all of these stories, many years have passed, so there are still things that could be speculated in between each game. It's still far too early to see whether the Lies of Peace story will mimic this part of storytelling when it comes to what story will be told in the next installment, but from what we know, it does leave something to the imagination. From Software has a unique way of telling stories without the hassle of creating a lot of extra reading from things that we probably won't experience because none of their games are bloated. Lies of P mimics this in their approach in the telling of the story of Pinocchio. And there are elements that change the story depending on not only the choices that you make, but the lies that you tell to get certain endings. Dark Souls does this through the people or creatures you meet to reach their endings. In Dark Souls, there are people that you meet that tells a part of their story if you follow through and meet them in their designated areas. In Dark Souls 3, if you follow through Sigward's quest, you'll learn the story between him and Yorm and he will actively join you in the fight. Lies of P tells their stories through certain defeated mini-bosses and the people you meet along the way that ask you to obtain items for them. In other instances, there are certain elements that they mimic from souls involving the survivors in Krat Hotel when it comes to meeting them in different areas. Alidoro, for instance, is a stalker that you can either send directly to Krat Hotel or send to Vanini Works. If you send him to the factory, he will question the trust between you two and he will give you another chance to send him to Krat Hotel. He is essential when it comes to trading in boss ergo, so I would highly recommend sending him to the hotel upon meeting him for the new players out there. However, on my first playthrough, I was very cautious of him, especially when Geppetto tells you not to trust alchemists or stalkers. 
Sending him to the hotel brings out another quest line that you can complete for Eugenie later in the game, which will prompt another choice to lie or tell the truth upon choosing to complete this quest. In Dark Souls 1, saving Lutrec results in the death of the Firekeeper if you don't take care of him soon after saving him. If he succeeds in killing her, you will have the chance to bring her back once you reach Honor Londo. Now obviously there is way more to this than I'm bringing to light, but my point here was to show the similarities of the storytelling while also showing the ways that they are unique. Obviously Liza P has way less in terms of everything that Souls has when it comes to their story, but as I said before, it's quality over quantity. And while Souls lives by this as well, I think that because Liza P has less of a story to tell, it leaves them more room to develop for other possibilities story-wise, especially since this is only their first installment and their DLC has yet to be released. There is obviously going to be a difference graphically given the time of the Dark Souls trilogy and the Lies of P releases. All of the Dark Souls games have a kind of grainy feel to them while Lies of P is smoother and more fluid in motion. In the comments in the last video I did in the Lies of P, someone brought this to my attention and I even noticed it when I was playing Souls on stream, that when you play Lies of P and then go back to play Souls, it doesn't feel quite as smooth to run through Souls. I had to process that for myself, and to be honest, I'm okay with that. Souls wouldn't be the same without that little bit of choppiness in 3, or the slow clunky motions of 1, and even the myriads of things wrong with 2. To me, it's just what makes Souls games. That being said, it's really important that when we talk about the graphical differences between the Souls trilogy and Lies of P, that we remember that there is a pretty big gap between the two. Even with Dark Souls 3 having been released in 2016, that's still a 7 year gap for things to improve graphically. And it should show to be honest, it wouldn't make sense for them to release Liza P and it not look and feel the way it does given the console generation that we're in. This is a conversation for another time as well, but I would argue that there have been far too many conversations around games that don't reach the full potential of this current gen of consoles graphically depending on the game and which platform that you play on. So I'm glad that the Lies of P released in the state that it's in, and that doesn't take anything away from the Souls trilogy for me. Throughout the trilogy, we saw nothing but improvements graphically, with 1 and 3 bringing their games to life through the textures of their worlds for the times that the games were developed in, and 2 making how it feels to run through a Souls title smoother and faster than 1. When 3 came out, it was obvious that they had learned a lot from the last two installments and Bloodborne, which we will get into later. Both the Souls trilogy and the Lies of P both have their own ways of bringing out what they need to graphically. I'll start by talking about Souls 1 since that is meant to introduce you to the trilogy. While very slow and clunky, the graphical focus was mostly aesthetic, using not only the look of the characters and enemies, but the scenery around you which I will get into in a little bit. 2 also tries to focus on aesthetics to a degree, but their main focus was to get rid of the clunky heavy feel, and by adding as much as they did to the world as a whole, I would imagine that it was harder to actually improve on anything graphically past that. The graphics for 1 are something I expect with the textures illuminating the elements of the scenes for its time, and while you as the player were clunky, the enemies moved way more fluidly. 2 seems to improve on the player's motions, but the enemies have very stiff and clunky motions. This works heavily against you in boss fights, because while you would think it would make their motions easier to tell, and they do for the most part, your attack animations, the direction of those attack animations, and the hitboxes on both ends are somewhat of a hassle to deal with. That's not just in boss fights either, that's in every encounter. Graphically, Dark Souls 2 looks sandpapered down compared to its predecessor and its successor. Don't get me wrong, there are still some good qualities graphic wise that it tries to do in its scenery, but it doesn't bring out the soul in Souls. Dark Souls 3 is a showing of all of the things that From Software learned from the previous titles graphically. The fluidity is equally distributed between both the player and the enemies alike. The textures feel more fine tuned which brings out more of the energy that they were trying to illuminate in the Souls game. And there is a bit of choppiness when playing this title, but things move at a much faster pace than the last two games. Lies of P is smooth in every way, shape, and form graphically, and it has to be. 
But the kinds of elements that they brought mechanically, it would be a shame if you were fighting the enemies and the bosses for that matter, and they have to deal with being stiff, clunky, and choppy on top of what its enemies already bring to the fight. Liza P has a lot of enemies that aside from the puppets do a lot of sporadic movements, and the amount of polish that was put into the designs, motions, and textures of the game shows that they knew they couldn't come out with a broken product. I've talked a lot about the textures in both series, but I haven't touched on the scene which helps bring these games together to create the worlds. Dark Souls has some very imaginative worlds, and with the exception of Dark Souls 2, they are also very cohesive. Dark Souls 1 highlights a world that has fallen in the beginning times of the first flame through using the elements of the immediate scenes that surrounds the player and only a couple of places illuminate distant areas. They utilize a mixture of bright and dark colors to bring out the beauty or darkness depending on where you are, with Honor Londo being one of the game's greatest places to see and Ulasal Township being one of the darkest the further you go in. I know the Tomb of Giants in New Londo is pretty dark, but what I mean is that Ulisal Township highlights more of the emotional feel of darkness from the abyss the further down you go. These elements help tell of the time of the prosperous kingdom and how the land fell from attempting to rekindle a dying flame and tells a tale of the events that took place beforehand. Add on the element of broken structures and you have a recipe for a great scenery that leaves much to the imagination. While your path is somewhat linear, the world itself isn't, taking you into a giant loop and a lot of the time leading you back to places that connect to areas you've already been to, making this the most cohesive out of all three titles. Two is a different story from its soul's brethren, being the black sheep of the family in every way, shape, and form. As I've already said, the land that surrounds you looks sandpapered down, the textures don't feel believable, and to be honest, it doesn't look like any leaps were made in terms of graphics. However, what they lack up close, they do try to make up for in the scenes where views come into play. Hyde's Tower of Flame is always my go-to, but the frozen Elium Lois is my favorite area in the game when it comes to this. There are parts of the game that are somewhat cohesive, but let's be honest, the puzzle pieces do not match most of the time the more you travel through the Land of Drain Lake. I touched on this in the Dark Souls Trilogy review about how the sky seems to change so often, but since that review, I have a better understanding. I already talked about how Dark Souls 2 was meant to be an open world game and how big the world is shows that. With that being said, there are parts that make sense. Majula, Hyde's Tower of Flame, and the Forest of Giants represent the kind of day side to things showing the setting sun with the Huntsman's Copes, the Lost Bastille, and Drain Lake Castle being kind of the night side of things. The thing that doesn't help this are the places that you travel to in between that will leave you in confusion as to how they even match with the last area you were in. And as I've said before, this is the least linear game in the series. This is how it works. Majula is at the center, even though it's at the edge of the map, for the worlds to connect with a few main paths. Those paths lead to other areas that branch off into either singular or multiple paths that lead to other areas that end. And while those paths are linear for the most part, it really doesn't leave much room to be as cohesive as the first title. However, it doesn't mean that there isn't any type of cohesiveness at all. In fact, one example where it tries to be cohesive is when you travel by boat to get to the Lost Bastille from No Man's War. Dark Souls 2 is a vast land that is filled with a lot of nothing and tries to overcompensate for this by using not only distance, but it introduces blurs to try and enhance the views. And it's successful in doing so, but it would be better if they had more to offer. And by having so many areas to travel to, it leaves many of the areas that you travel to feeling quite condensed. Minus the DLC, of course, which has more to offer in terms of how big the three areas are. Actually, the DLC seems to bring out more of the textures and cohesiveness than anywhere else in the game. Maybe it's because these areas are not connected in any way to the original map, allowing it to focus more on these elements. Which brings us to Dark Souls 3, which is the most linear of all three games. Dark Souls 3 starts you off on a linear path that branches off to different pathways at certain points. And it has a decent sized map, being bigger than the first installment and smaller than the second. This game's cohesiveness is bound to the areas that you travel to rather than the world as a whole, so it leaves more room to focus on the other things this game does in its scenes. It's important to note that by the time this game came out, Bloodborne released the year prior. Bloodborne would then be the formula for how they designed their Souls titles from there on. 
meaning that from the world of Yarnum to the transitory land of Lotharic, they learned a few new tricks to help bring out the feelings and the story of all the scenery. Not only do the textures of everything in your immediate areas feel and look believable, but they highlight the areas in the distance as well as areas you can't travel to through vibrant colors depending on where you are just like the first one. The third one adds on to that by making use of blurs and silhouettes of the surrounding areas that cannot be traveled to, giving the feeling of a land much bigger than the road you traveled, even illuminating the areas that you can travel to more. Three is meant to end the series, and every one of this game's areas backs this up, especially when you reach the final stretch towards the Lothric Brothers. It still amazes me how they made this game so linear and yet still managed to bring everything together full circle. Lies of P can easily be compared to the first and third Souls games in the fact that it brings the map full circle like the first and is as linear as the third bringing out their utilization of a single area's cohesiveness. It can also be compared to one by the fact that it uses immediate areas to highlight the feelings that the devs were trying to capture but then goes a step beyond by adding other elements like different times of day and weather in certain places and times in the game. I will say that looking back on the game, I wish that they would have made these elements less scripted to the player's progression in the game and more of an open world type of timing when it came to these elements without the time skipping. It's still nice to have these types of elements though and Dark Souls 3 kind of does this through the blocking of the sun once you reach a certain point as well. We can look at the graphics and scenery and see that there are noticeable differences between the trilogy and Lies of P as I said in the beginning, and they're supposed to be. The Souls trilogy improved throughout each installment and with the current console generation that we're in, it would have been disappointing to see Lies of P released in the same state as the trilogy. It's also nice to see a Souls-like title take certain elements from the originals and actually expound on its elements rather than just put out a Souls-like title and it have no substance, no improvements, and only taking singular elements that fans talk about. Graphics are one thing, but let's be honest, the scenery brings out the souls and souls, and it definitely brought out the souls and lives of P. Controls and mechanics wise, each game is about the same, and while graphical hiccups definitely make this aspect a challenge, each souls title has its own form of convenience. In each souls game, you can equip your belt with the items you see fit to use in fights. You can switch between these said items by simply pressing the d-pad in whatever direction depending on whether you switch items, weapons, or spells. All three have you use a smaller menu to select either your character status, equipment, and items. With all three of the menus, you are able to move and select items, though one makes it difficult to do this task because you have to scroll through the list to find your items. 2 and 3 make this task more convenient by condensing all of your items into boxes making it easier to multitask moving with item selection. However, it doesn't take away from these games mechanically in combat because you should already have the tools necessary to take down whoever or whatever you need to. Though one of the biggest inconveniences in the first two is healing with Estus flasks which leaves you open for attack. 2 tries to offset this by adding in life gems that heal you slowly or at a faster pace depending on which type of life gem you take and how many you take at a time. However, the Estus effects between the first and second installments are worlds apart. When you take Estus in Souls 1, healing is instantaneous whereas taking Estus in 2 feels very drawn out, leaving you even more vulnerable to losing fights. Souls 3 brings your Estus effects back to the instantaneous results with the ability to move slowly while in use, giving you a slight chance to avoid taking damage. In enemies encounters though, if you have everything set to the slots of your choosing, then it's really simple to navigate. This is where things get tricky to talk about. Lies of P tries to mimic every aspect of navigation from Souls 3 in terms of the menus with one added convenience from all of the other menus and that's the ability to go directly to your belt rather than navigate to a different menu altogether. On top of having instant access to your belt, if you select any empty or occupied spaces it takes you directly to the items menu. And while you can do this in the Soul series, you have to be in the correct menu to do so. Of course, you can equip primary and secondary weapons and you even have the ability to add an extra weapon slot once you unlock it in the P organ. At the Stargazer you can switch out the arms you're going to use and again the P organ allows you to have a secondary arm to switch out in your encounters. You get an upper belt and a lower belt and even an extra bag to carry more items. 
The only problem is that after you get into your item or equipment bag, you lose the ability to move after the first initial menu that you use to navigate between these things, which ends up making this the most inconvenient menu, even with the conveniences that they tried to add. Why did I bring this up now? Well, because this is where we run into a problem. Loss of P is way more mechanically driven than the Souls trilogy and being able to have accessibility is extremely necessary. Now I don't have anything bad to say mechanically when it comes to the Lies of P because well everything is definitely more focused around how you time everything and I didn't have any issues there. The issue comes in when bosses come to play. In the Souls trilogy you have more leniency when it comes to dodging seeing as they are not focused solely on blocking. You even have the ability to parry certain bosses and weapon durability isn't as much of an issue either in the Souls games. In one, your weapons will need to be repaired, but it takes a while for them to get damaged and you can buy a repair kit to fix your equipment at the bonfire so that you don't constantly have to go to the blacksmith and you have repair powder as well. In two, your weapons have way less durability, but you can just sprinkle some repair powder on them and you'll be good as long as you time the usage right. In three, your weapons are virtually invincible so you don't have to worry about repairs, leaving you more time to focus on other things in a boss encounter. With that on top of being able to switch between your items with ease gives the Lies of P more problems. Lies of P hitboxes are far less forgiving to you so you have to be on your P's and Q's when it comes to blocking and dodging. And switching between your upper and lower belt can be quite an inconvenience seeing that in order to use the items in either belt you have to make sure that not only do you have the item selected but the particular belt as well. I can't tell you how many times I failed because I tried to heal but ended up using the grinder instead because I was still in souls mode thinking that I could have the particular items on my belt selected to use them. Not only that, but you have to use the left or right buttons on the d-pad to switch between weapons and legion arms. And you have the extra bag which serves to be more or less the same as the trilogy's belt, but who's going to think to go for items in a place that you have to hold down the X or A button depending on what platforms you're playing on to get to those items? That's right. To get to your extra bag you have to hold down the X or A button and then use the arrows on the d-pad to select and use items. And your weapon durability in Lies of P can feel short in boss fights or any fight really because you're constantly guard parrying or perfect guarding. And this is mixed in with your light, heavy, and fabled arts attacks so you have to really focus on your weapons meter while dodging and blocking at the same time. Fortunately you have your grinder to help you with this but let's be honest here. You have to time out when to use it very wisely, especially with bosses that move at super speeds. And good luck with enemies that do acidic damage because that only adds to the problem. And if you don't have anything that lowers weapon durability consumption, anything that speeds up your weapons recovery, or the ability for unused weapons to recover naturally unlocked from the P organ, then this can become very problematic in certain encounters. By this point with the Souls trilogy, we know who we can parry and who we can't, but at the beginning it was a lot of guesswork trying to figure this out. In Lies of P, everyone can be guard parried and every enemy that uses fury attacks can be perfect guarded. Timing is what seems to be the issue. In the Souls series, you have to worry about timing, but you have less to worry about. It's simply about knowing the enemy's patterns. In Lies of P, not only do you have to know the enemy's patterns, but you have to manage more of the timing of their attacks. Lies of P was built for precision in every way, shape, and form. Not only that, but you also have a lot more to focus on, so it's not always going to be possible for you as the player to be able to guard parry every attack or perfect guard every fury attack that comes your way. I theorize that this can make guard parrying feel very inconsistent. I will go over that another time though. The controls on all the games have controls that at least make sense for how they're meant to be played. Even if the Lies of P may feel inconvenient at times, you at least know that switching between the two games there are only going to be a few things that you have to adapt to control mechanic wise. Enemies in power scaling in both the Souls trilogy and the Lies of P both work the same in the fact that the further you progress the stronger enemies get and the more souls and ergo you can acquire by defeating them. In both series you know you're not just going to be able to simply waltz into a new area and start overpowering everyone. And in both series you have everything you need to help you get through the challenges they both present. 
In the Soul series, you have the ability to upgrade your weapons and shields, and you can even infuse special gems to said weapons to give you a certain elemental damage. You can also upgrade your armor to add to your defenses. In the Lives of P, you can upgrade your weapons and even switch handles to add more attack power. You can alter handles with cranks between either motivity, technique, or advance to further up the attack power of your weapons as well. The rest of your upgrades come from using the P organ which offers extra abilities on top of the main abilities that you unlock by using cords. Your costumes are more for show seeing as they don't add any extra attributes or defenses. Instead you have amulets which could add on to your health, legion, or how much you can carry just to give some examples. And you have defense parts that serve as a kind of armor that give you defenses against not only physical attacks, but elemental as well depending on which part you have equipped. The soul's equivalent to adding on attributes will be the rings you collect which you can do some of the same things. In all of the soul series there are enemies that seem stronger than boss fights that you can skip past or fight to get certain items and it doesn't hinder your progress. And for the most part Lies of P does this too except for in parts where it doesn't. In these parts there are enemies, not many bosses, that actually have to be beaten in order to get to the next area like this guy for instance. Beating this puppet is the only way to unlock the gate to the next portion of this area. And this is a challenge because he just pops out when you least expect it and starts swinging on you giving you little time to think about what your next move is. Other than that, both series offer a way to farm souls and ergo to get stronger, by the choice of the player of course, explore areas to collect better items for upgrades even if they are more of a rarity in Lives of P, and different choices on what to level up depending on your playstyle. I'm not going to list off all the ways that you have to tackle enemy encounters again because there are a lot and truth be told, I understand if everybody is not going to be able to spot everything even on multiple playthroughs. The challenge level on both series definitely starts off challenging and slowly offers you a way to get around these challenges the more you progress. Though this is where I will give Dark Souls 2 more of its just dues where it stops enemies from respawning depending on how many times you've died in that area which I believe it's about 15 to 20 times if I remember correctly. So even if it does seem like it takes a while for this to take effect, at least it's there to help the player. While I did say in the Lies of P you have more to worry about, if you plan everything out wisely, you can shorten your boss fights quite significantly, and elemental damage in the Lies of P seems to stack more heavily and longer than in the Soul series. With that being said, elemental damage stacks against you just as easy and just as long if not checked with certain items to cure those ailments. However, after everything you get to unlock, plus the updates that were released, you have quite a bit of working for you than against you. Yes, there are challenges of keeping track of your weapons, durability, legion, fabled arts, and your stamina all while worrying about the enemy's attack patterns and timing so that you can block and dodge, but there are items that have far more damaging effects than items and souls to help you lessen those worries. Souls and Lies has a diverse set of enemies, some of which you will see repeats of as you make progress in stronger forms, and the DLC from each Souls game brings out more imaginative and stronger enemies. Again, the only thing that irritates me is the fact that enemies in the first souls have the most uncanny targeting when it comes to dodging, where they seem to be able to move with you wherever you dodge. The second souls has the most relentless enemies in all of the soul series that will chase you down forever, but in all three for the most part, the enemy's moves are easy to telegraph with certain enemies that hit like a ton of cinder blocks that drop better rewards. Lies of P carries the same elements as the Soul series when it comes to enemies that are easy to read and the stronger enemies, but it mimics Dark Souls 1 as far as certain enemies locking onto you when you're trying to dodge and mimics the third with how smooth the movements of the enemies are. Lies of P enemies move like they're having constant spasms as if their moves are somehow meant to throw you off, and while they can be successful, these aren't the enemies that are the worst. Lies takes a page out of the Dark Souls series in the challenge department with enemies like this that are equivalent to boss fights. Again, this game is way more technical when it comes to enemies of all kinds, so guard parrying or perfect guarding fury attacks to break certain enemies' weapons and or do poise damage is an added plus. This brings more immersion to the enemies, highlighting more of their weaknesses than any of the Souls trilogy does with just parrying enemies. I can't touch on the DLC for Lies of P yet because we don't know when that is coming, but I can speculate that if the developers are going to do their best to emulate a great Souls experience, then they will definitely bring about new enemies and different challenges like a Souls title. I've touched on enemies that feel like bosses, but let's actually touch on the bosses of both the series.
Souls bosses have a lot of creativity put into them. From their looks to their lore, the bosses truly offer quite the experience and more to the Souls story if you decide to look into their background. But that wasn't the main focus when we entered the arena for the first time with these deranged powerhouses. It was the challenges behind fighting them that sparked conversations in the community. Throughout the trilogy, we can compare bosses from who's the hardest to their movements, theme songs, our least favorite to our most favorite. Add in souls like title bosses and we broaden the conversations by comparing the original trilogy bosses to their off-brand counterparts. So of course Lies of P would be no different when we have any souls conversation of this type, especially when it comes to this category. I'll begin by saying that in each souls game you play you'll notice the difference in the boss encounters. I also want to talk about phases because in the review I did for Lies of P, I was obviously mistaken in how they actually work when it comes to movesets and the fact that whenever I fight bosses in a souls like title it's hard for me to turn off my souls brain. The first souls titled bosses are the most unique out of the trilogy in certain aspects. For instance, the asylum demon is the only beginning boss fight that stands in your way but is optional to fight in the first moments of meeting it. Meaning that you can choose to fight it with a broken sword or wait until you get your weapons to do an air stab taking a portion of its health down before fighting. Ceaseless Discharge can be cheesed by leading him towards the entrance of the arena where he will hold on for his life at the edge where you can one shot him into falling. The Bed of Chaos turns Dark Souls into a full blown Mario platformer and if you die and come back to the arena you can continue where you left off. And Seath the Scaleless has a scripted fight where you lose and are sent to the prison section of the Duke's archives. This game is also the first of the series to introduce a second phase in the Smo and Ornstein fight. It's also the only gank fight where you don't have to beat both bosses giving you the choice of who you fight in the next phase. This is also one of the most praised fights in the series for what it has to offer as far as the arena theme and their backstory. Bosses in the first souls have a decent flow of movement, some with a decent amount of speed such as Artorius and Manus, and some are just annoying to fight such as the Moonlight Butterfly, Bed of Chaos, and Dark Sun Gwendolyn. I have to say for as clunky as the controls are in this game, boss fights are quite challenging because it seems like they move with more fluidity than you do, and for the bosses with speed this only adds to the challenge. The bosses in one are truly something to enjoy and are a great introduction into the trilogy telling the story of why they exist and building up the main story. And yeah there are some repeat bosses and some annoying ones like the Bell Gargoyles or the Capra Demon but that's to be expected. Not every boss is going to be high on the opinion polls of the Souls community's eyes. Dark Souls 2 is definitely the most generous when it comes to bosses and in Souls fashion offers lore behind the bosses to boot. While the bosses in the second installment don't move as fluidly, you'll have a different challenge to overcome and that's the hitboxes and the motion of your character. This game seems to suffer the opposite of the first souls with you moving more fluidly than the bosses do, but what they lack in motion they gain in bad hitboxes. There are already so many flaws in Dark Souls 2 when it comes to the quality being as big as it is, and the bosses are no exception. It seems like they put forth so much effort into how many bosses there were that they forgot about the quality part. Out of all of the Souls games, these are some of the most frustrating fights in the trilogy. From getting hit by the tail end of already completed animations, to getting caught in your own attack animations, direction and all, to some of the most delayed attacks and we can't forget about all of the gank fights. It just feels like Dark Souls 2 tries too hard to be hard. I will say though that even though there is a lack of quality in the bosses, there are some pretty imaginative bosses like the Demon of Song. Some of the bosses focus on what you do to the arena before you get to the fights or even what you wear to the fight. Like the fact that if you put on Valstat's armor during the Fume Knights fight, he'll automatically go into rage mode at the start of the fight. For the record, I've never done this because the Fume Knight is already enough of a hassle and enraging him at the start is not a problem I ever want. Now I want to make it clear that while Dark Souls 2 has a grand total of 42 bosses, a lot of them are optional and the second installment is the only Souls game in the trilogy to allow you the option to go to New Game Plus whenever you choose. So you'll get the chance to tackle some of the bosses that you might have missed or skipped over. The third installment is way more balanced when it comes to the movements of both your characters and the bosses. The hitboxes are also way more forgiving than in the previous titles, and without the need to worry about repairing your weapon, it gives you a better chance to focus on the enemies ahead, and you'll need that focus because some of these bosses are the fastest you'll see throughout the entire trilogy. 
Dark Souls 3 takes the idea of second phases and places them at the halfway point of most of your boss fights. Some have more phases than others, for instance Sister Frida, one of my favorite fights, has three phases marking them after you clear the health meter all three times. Meanwhile, the Nameless King also has three phases, the first being over after you defeat the King of Storms, and the last two work as most of your normal boss fights, marking the third halfway through his health meter. Here we go back to the quality of boss designs, lowering the number of bosses to 25. Of course all three games have optional bosses, but Dark Souls 1 and 3 makes it more reasonable to tackle them, with there being less of them and less of a problem given by the smaller enemies to get to them. The lore from the third's bosses brings the story full circle with some answering the questions from the first, giving that more organized form of storytelling that the first brought. And the fights feel nothing less than epic, from the pacing all the way down to the music. Souls bosses are a swing or a miss for how aggressive they are, with most leaving you some time to heal and equip what you need and others constantly rushing you, but all of the bosses in the series have weaknesses that we get the tools to exploit them with. And those said tools, such as pine resins, all can make the fights much faster if you get past the boss's patterns of attack. The same thing applies to Liza P when it comes to exploiting boss's weaknesses, and you'll need everything possible to help you in these boss fights. I said it before that the bosses are not so forgiving when it comes to anything, whether it be equipping and using certain items to repairing your weapons. That's why it's very important to make sure you have everything you need in order. I would even recommend making sure that your P-Organ is upgraded to what you feel is important to you based off of your playstyle. Bosses in Lies of P are always on go time except for the few times where they seem to back off to regain some poise, or at least that's what it looks like. Other than that, they will not hesitate to attack and backing away does no good because all the bosses, both mini and main, can close the gap quickly. Both you and the bosses move very seamlessly so they are built for precision, so timing is definitely more of a focus than it is in Souls. It's not just knowing when to block dodge and attack either, you have to know what time to utilize your other assets. Again, you have a lot more to worry about in these boss fights than in Souls. In Souls, blocking isn't highlighted as much and there are only certain bosses that can be parried. In Lies of P, blocking, guard parrying, and perfect parrying fury attacks is a huge focus and is highly encouraged from the beginning of the game. The good news is that while these actions do have consequences to you that you'll have to manage, they also have consequences to all of the bosses and even more to the bosses with breakable weapons. Performing perfect blocking and parrying does wonders when dropping a boss's poise, giving you the opportunity to deal a fatal blow to their health. However, even timing for this is crucial because you'll only get a certain window of time to be able to deal fatal damage. For one, you have to either use the fabled arts or a heavy attack to down the boss and then you have to stand in the designated area to deal a fatal blow. And the timing varies between bosses so I don't have the precise timing on each one. Another challenge is that when it comes time to deal the heavy attacks to achieve this, that the bosses never slow down and some will even get more aggressive or back away to avoid being downed. Only certain bosses block and mimic players' actions. In Lies of P, it seems like bosses know what they need to do to hinder your progress. Now, there is something that I need to address, and that's phases. In the Lies of P review I did, I said that phases are not what they seem, and that some bosses have four phases. Well, I was completely wrong about that. I will address what I was wrong about, but I want to talk about the phases in Souls first. Dark Souls 1 was the first Souls game to introduce a second phase and even give you a choice of who you fought in the next phase. Now you can make the argument that bosses like Manus have a second phase based off of how Dark Souls 3 does things for the simple fact that if you lower his health to a certain point he'll start spewing dark magic at you but that just isn't the case. His dark magic is only an added attack. In Dark Souls 2 the boss phases are the same as the first with Valstat being the only known boss with a second phase and the rest of the bosses like the Fume Knight only having added buffs and attacks all in one phase. The third Souls title is the only game in the trilogy to have distinct phases with the bosses powering up and the music changing. Some even have 3 to 4 depending on who you're fighting. And this is where I was wrong about Liza P because this takes how bosses works from all three games and mixes it up. Phases aren't what they seem, but let me correct myself on the fact that there is only one boss with three phases and it's not even on a traditional Souls standpoint. 
The Black Rabbit Brotherhood is extremely unique because apparently the boss phases don't come from the main boss, but rather from each sibling's entry into the arena. I know it sounds crazy, but I had to really research that and it was rather odd seeing as the older brother never changes his attacks or even buffs. So I apologize for my error of thinking that the boss phases work as I described them the first time. Here's how they really work. All mini bosses have one phase. Bosses at the beginning have two phases split at the halfway point of their health bar. After reaching your fourth main boss, the phases change by splitting the phases between two separate health bars is an indication that the boss is about to unleash its true form. And for the most part, it will remain that way for the rest of the game except for a couple of other main bosses. Where I was mistaken is that on the King of Puppets in the first phase, halfway through his health bar he adds on attacks, and does this even in the second phase as Romeo. These are only considered added attacks and not phases. This is an aspect where I had to turn off my soul's brain to understand that this is not Dark Souls so the rules are different. Nevertheless, Lives of P does a pretty good job of how they mimic boss encounters and more. I haven't even touched on summon signs and your specter that you can summon before entering most of the main boss arenas. This can either be a big help or a waste in both the Soul series and Lives of P depending on how you use them. There are huge differences in the summons between the two series starting with what is required. In the Souls trilogy, to even be able to see and use summon signs, you need to use humanity for the first souls, human effigy in the second souls, and embers in the third. On top of that, using these items also leaves you open to invasion. Also, since these games are online, you can summon your friends or be summoned for your friends with the use of the white soapstones. This lasts up until you reach and defeat a boss, then you wash, rinse, and repeat the summon cycle. Summoning your friends also makes the boss stronger and healthier to try and balance out the challenge pool. When you summon NPCs, it's never just one specific NPC, it's normally a mixture between characters you've met or maybe some other random NPCs depending on which souls you're playing. And each summons has their own ability so you don't have to worry about taking care of them. In Liza P, you're not online so there's no risk of summoning and nothing for you to consume to summon. Instead, you use star fragments at a pool in front of the main boss's doors called the Crack's Calling, and when you enter the arena, the specter is there with you. The specter is the same throughout the entire game, minus its weapons, which shows you the weapon you get from that boss when you get there ergo to trade in. Your specter doesn't necessarily need to be maintained if you don't want to, but it is highly recommended that you do. This is done through the wish cube that you acquire from Zhanjo, who also sells you wish stones through gold coin fruit. Each of these stones buffs either you, your specter, or you both by giving you certain healing abilities or elemental abilities to your specter. Timing when to use this is really important, especially since most of the bosses are relentless when attacking. I see the NPC summons in the specter as more of bait to be used to distract the bosses, except with the specter you have to be more mindful than with the NPCs of souls. The Spectre can be an absolute joke if not maintained and if you let him aggro the boss, but if you buff it and you have the ability to use your wish cube multiple times, then it makes the Souls NPCs look like paperweights. One of the greatest things that I love more than anything is the fact that in Liza P, if you die in the arena and you have Ergo on hand, you get the chance to get your Ergo back before you enter the arena again. In the Souls trilogy, if you die and you have Souls, then they go back to where you died just like everywhere else. This isn't all bad, but I myself tend to forget to grab them at times, especially against bosses I still struggle with to this day. Other than that, I love the boss fights that both titles have to offer. Again, it's what makes these titles worthwhile. Now as of the making of this video, I have been running through the game again on a new file without New Game Plus and there are a couple of bosses that feel super nerfed, like the first phase of the Puppet King and for that matter the second phase as well. It kind of takes a little bit away from the challenge aspect, and as that is one of my favorite boss fights, I'm a little saddened by this change. However, I do understand why they did it, and the fact that the devs took the time to consider the player says a lot. There are still challenges to the fight to overcome, so while they did do some nerfing, they didn't do enough to not provide the adrenaline rush that comes from fighting bosses. While Liza P has a lot of similarities to the Souls trilogy, there are still plenty of differences as well, all things that make it its own away from the Souls series. 
There are also things that separate it from the Souls trilogy that could work against it depending on your point of view. For instance, Lies of P doesn't give you the ability to customize your character like the Souls trilogy, but it wasn't meant to. And while you could make the argument that in order to further immerse the player into the game, P can look however the player wants him to. I believe that is what the costumes are for though. Costumes may not do anything in terms of your stats, but you have plenty of other things that help with this. One thing I didn't cover when I talked about the scenes is that Souls adds the elements of secret paths to get to other areas or items. Lots of P does this in the form of progressing rather than just simply tapping walls, meaning the more you progress through an area, the more there is to uncover, even if the areas are small. And by exploring, you can find trinity doors and hidden places that lead you to special items. Lies of P encourages and maybe even entices the player to explore every part of the game to find all that it has to offer. There are a lot of Souls-like titles that try to be Souls and most of them completely miss the mark for me. Most don't have the story, the areas don't have the same level of design and love put into them. They try to add on a challenge that feels artificial and honestly not that engaging and they don't even bring anything new to the genre. So what does this mean for Lies of P? Does Lies of P do Souls better than Souls? Yes, Lies of P not only manages to take every element necessary to have a Souls title, but they exceed even Souls by putting extra focus on making sure that the challenges are even more engaging, giving everyone not only the specific weaknesses like a Souls title, but also making sure that they share your weaknesses with you. And on top of that, they take a classic story and twist it into something darker and more sinister than the original. You also have very awesome music to add to the atmosphere of the game. And it does have its flaws, some of which I addressed, but the flaws don't overshadow the amount of effort put into making this a great Souls-like title. It's not easy to imitate a Souls game, but they did it and they added to it. And even though they nerfed some of the aspects of the game, I hope that From Software team is smiling at NeoWiz, and I hope that they even add some of the challenging elements of Lies of P into future Souls titles. That's it for this comparison though. Do you think that Lies of P did Souls better? Let me know in the comments below. Join me again as we bring the land of Krat against the land of Yarnum. Until then, you all be easy and I'll see you next time.